Hello and welcome to Roundtable. Get Brexit done was the slogan the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson used to win the 2019 general election. He also promised, as he put it, to unleash Britain's potential. But did he manage to deliver on that promise? It's been 12 months since Britain broke free from Brussels, but still many have doubts Brexit will succeed. A recent survey shows 60% of people think Brexit has gone wrong. Can the Brexit millions voted for be delivered? Very good to have your company. I'm David Foster. From shortages of HGV drivers to empty supermarket shelves, the impact that Brexit, and it mustn't be forgotten, COVID had on Britain's supply chains has been enormous. Despite signing the new trade deal with more than 60 signatory countries since leaving the bloc, things have not been easy for the UK government. And without EU membership, the picture for Britain's trade is only going to keep changing, according to the European Centre for International Political Economy. It says UK companies have no markets in which it is now easy to trade. What impact has Brexit and the pandemic had on the UK economy? A survey by Delta Poll found that 10% of Brexit voters think it's been a success and 67% think it will eventually come good. Meanwhile, EU countries have largely recovered to pre-COVID levels of trade. Flows for the UK in quarter three of 2021 were the lowest value relative to GDP since 2009. Well, that is the trade picture. But the latest economic data shows that the UK's economy surpassed pre-COVID levels. Gross domestic product expanded by 0.9 of 1% between October and November of last year. That as Germany's economy heads for a possible recession, the second in the pandemic. The economy there shrinking by half of 1% to 1% in the final quarter of 2021. I'm very pleased to be able to say that we can welcome back to Roundtable Sir John Curtis. He's in Glasgow, British political scientist and professor of politics at the University of Strathclyde. We go to London and see David Hennig. He's there, director of the UK Trade Policy Project at the European Centre for International Political Economy. We mentioned those a little bit earlier as we started the programme. And Matt Withers, journalist at the New European. Last on the programme 12 months ago when we were considering what may happen, and he will tell us what he thinks has happened. So, uh, John Curtis, let me start with you. Um, is there anything to suggest a, a growing optimism among the British public about Brexit, or are the people as gloomy as perhaps they were 12 months ago? Well, I think the first thing one has to say, David, is that when it comes to the issue of Brexit, there isn't really a British public. There are two publics. There's the Remain public, and there is the Leave public. And of course, the two groups continue to diverge very substantially in their views about what's been the impact of Brexit so far in future, and therefore how things are going. Uh, Leave voters are always going to be more favourable towards Brexit than Remain voters. That said, um, I think it's probably fair to say that um, both groups are now a little less positive in their evaluations of Brexit than they were 12 months ago. I mean, YouGov have certainly asked on a number of occasions during the course of the year, the very simple question, do you think Brexit's going well or badly? Now, at the beginning of the year, uh, we had around two thirds of Remain voters saying it was going badly, but only about 16% of Leave voters. And now it's about 80% of Remain voters who think it's going badly. And even amongst Leave voters, the figure's gone up to over a quarter. So both groups, to some degree, during the course of the last 12 months, have become somewhat more critical. And almost undoubtedly, the period during the course of the year in which that happened is basically around September or so. You remember back in September, we had the arguments about the shortage of lorry drivers 
um, uh, the shortage of petrol, uh, the shortage of food in our shops. And some of that, at least, of course, was being blamed on coronavirus, but some of it was also being blamed on Brexit, and in particular, the tighter immigration policy on Brexit. And that does seem to have had some impact on public opinion. OK, so perhaps it's not quite as black and white as many people uh, felt during the, the argument about, uh, A, the referendum, and secondly, about whether we were going to get a decent deal. John, I refer you back to something um, that you wrote recently about how perceptions have changed. 20, 2019, 6% thought we would get a good deal. This is before we finally left the European Union. Uh, January 2021, so this was 12 months ago, 21%. So perceptions are shifting perhaps in favour of those who, who were in favour of leaving. Well, certainly as of January 21, there was something of a spike in proportion. We thought we had a good deal, but that did go back down again uh, back in August. But here, of course, again, we have to be very careful. You know, why is it that people think that we might have a bad deal? And the truth is that there are different motivations here, different motivations on the Remain and the Leave side. Frankly, on the Remain side, very few voters were ever going to be convinced that we were going to get a good deal out, out of our negotiations with the European Union. They were always pessimistic and they continue to be pessimistic. On the Leave side, in contrast, what you see behind the data is that, yeah, you know, for some Leave voters, yep, yeah, like some Remain voters, they feel we've ended up with a trade agreement that perhaps has resulted in a more distant relationship than perhaps that they were anticipating and wanting. But for others on the Leave side, they still think that the relationship that we have with the European Union is too close. And that on some issues, so for example, you know, on some of the things that's upset uh, voters during the course of the last 12 months, well, yes, for Remain voters, for some occasions, it's been about the supplies in the supermarkets. For Leave voters, for example, almost undoubtedly, one of the areas where now Leave voters really have lost a degree of confidence about the ability to Brexit to deliver is actually on immigration. And I think in part, that's to do with the media stories about asylum seekers coming across the channel. Uh, so bear in mind, therefore, that even when we are finding data which says, you know, more voters think we've got a bad deal than a good deal, the reasons for that can diverge. Um, and to that extent, at least, therefore, we shouldn't assume that, you know, if voters think we've got a uh, bad deal, that it's everybody thinking that, you know, Lord Frost has come up with bad negotiations because it's too remote. For some, he came up with something that was too close, although they're being disappointed about what's been happening to immigration. Uh, Matt, I will come to you in a little while. Uh, John, for now, thank you very much indeed. But David, let me go to you. I mentioned at the beginning of the programme, uh, your group said UK economies, ec companies have no markets in which it is now easy to trade. And yet you say you are still optimistic. Well, what has happened so far in terms of uh, UK trade performance with the EU? It's pretty much according to uh, predictions um, in, in, in line with forecasts. And that is that it has uh, it has fallen. You put in more trade barriers in place between the, the UK and the EU, your major trade partner, then that will hit uh, that will hit trade. And it's what we're seeing is roughly on the on the prediction uh, that that happened. And following on from uh, Sir John Curtis, that is going to cause a shock because, of course, the government were kind of denying that this would happen. The reason that I think it's not all doom and gloom is that if we are on prediction, this isn't the UK economy suddenly moving from being important economy to an unimportant one. We have taken, we are taking a, look, a hit on, on GDP of 4%. It will be hard to make that up. But on the other hand, the UK is still an important uh, global economy, still an important global trading power power, we still have the ability um, to find new ways to, to trade to, to improve. And I think that it is to a certain degree an, an encouragement that it is according to what we had forecast. It's not noticeably worse. Um, yeah, the UK economy is, is still, well, is you still growing. It's growing, isn't it? And it's growing, it's growing faster than some had thought. Well, we had a poor year last year. We had a poor year in uh, in the first year of the pandemic in 2020, we had a better year than many expected in 2021. The long run growth figures from 2023 onwards are not great. And what the UK government will need to do and any future UK government 
is to start thinking again about where the growth is going to come from. Um, that's still a little bit questionable. My optimism is that the UK can find ways to do it, not necessarily that that's being well handled by the current government. I think that we're still in search of a growth strategy. I simply feel that I'm not I'm not in the business of saying this is all this is all doom and gloom. It's very much according to forecast. OK, Matt, let me come to you. Um, Times article. Uh, last summer, so slightly more than six months ago, and it was Europeans agree. This is the headline. Europeans agree on one thing. The EU is broken. As many as 62 percent of those people questioned in France felt that it was damaged. It was broken uh, and would seem to intimate from that that they don't think they really ought to remain part of it. So Britain perhaps has made a, a decision which is reflected right the way across Europe. Well, I think you're taking a big leap there from people not happy with a, an institution, which is, is of course, flawed. I mean, the New European is a very pro-EU uh, publication, but we don't pretend that it's not a flawed uh, organisation, that uh, even even it, its leaders know uh, needs a lot of tender, loving care at the moment. That said, a lot of the people on the Brexit side of the argument, the Nigel Farage of this world, were talking about a domino effect, which would follow Brexit. We're not seeing that. The, the, the numbers of people... Uh, in EU countries who wish to see their, their country leave the EU are still uh, infinitesimally small. It's, you know, there's nobody in the French presidential election who's standingly on an explicitly Frexit ticket. So, uh, yeah, there's, al there's always going to be uh, grumbles and unhappiness, but certainly there hasn't been that, um, that domino effect that, that's been predicted. Uh, I think um, just following not, on with what's Britain, been said... Sorry to butt sorry. in. Didn't, didn't Britain show that it was better off out when it came to getting the vaccine rollout? And that was what an upset an awful lot of people across Europe, was that they didn't get the vaccines as quickly as, as people in the UK did. It's certainly it's certainly the case that the, that the UK performed exceptionally well in its uh, vaccine rollout initially, since since been overtaken largely by you know, a number of states with, within the EU. It's, it's not actually correct to say that we would have been held back from uh, pushing forward with our vaccine rollout, as someone suggested. That still could have happened within the EU, within the European medical agency. Well, well hang, hang on. I don't, I, I, I this, don't... Is a, this is a fact. The, the regulatory agency in the UK that approved the vaccines acted more quickly than the equivalent in the European Union was allowed to do. Therefore, yes, it was able I... to do it faster. It's certainly the case that the, that the UK performed very well in its vaccine rollout, and and we, I would I would give the, the the UK government credit for that. Absolutely, this is not a this is not binary. This is you know we are not an EU good, UK bad, and certainly you have to give the credit where it's due. But I don't I don't take the extrapolation that that you do from the figures in that Times article that the EU is somehow an institution on on the verge of collapse, and actually you find that in a lot of countries they they've looked at Brexit, and not a lot of them have said yes. That seems to be going well. We'll have a bit of that, thank you. OK, David, let me come back to you and then I'll come to you again, John, if I may. Um, listening to what you hear from Matt, do you think there are people out there who will never change their minds no matter what you present them with? I think that there were always people in the UK who were very much opposed to the UK being in the, the EU, whatever the evidence said otherwise. And I think that there will be people now who will be always wanting the UK to be part of the EU. Where I think it was difficult for trade specialists such as myself before is that those brackets seem to encompass most people so that there wasn't much of a middle ground to say, well, OK, uh, this is going to happen. How? What's the best way in which it can happen? And I think that what we hope to see is the creation of a, some kind of new consensus in the UK. This is how we're going to go forward with our trading relations, with our relations with the EU in general. It feels to me like we're a few years away from that because we'll still always geographically be part of Europe. It will still be a tremendously important market to our companies uh, for our trade. And as yet, we're still not quite there in terms of understanding what kind of relationship we could have as non-members. So um, I, I expect there always to be people who are very much opposed to the EU and always be those who are very much want the UK well, to be part What do you think? Uh, John, you're not only a reader of the, the political numbers and understander of, of the polls, a cephologist, but you're also a man with a great deal of experience looking back over many years of British politics. Do you see something different in what we've seen from the this year, if you can separate that from the pandemic? 
Well, the public certainly do find it difficult to distinguish between the two. Actually, uh, the UK Changing Europe organisation, which I'm part of, uh, did a poll recently with Redfield and Wilton, and it asked people, you know, do you think um, that uh, various aspects of the economy, public services, etc., have been affected positively or negatively by Brexit, and then asked them the same thing about coronavirus. And the intriguing thing that came out of that exercise, though perhaps we shouldn't have been surprised, is that people who think that, for example, the economy has been negatively impacted by Brexit, tend to be the same people who also think it's been negatively impacted by coronavirus. And of course, what's going on there, we should have to bear this in mind, is that basically those who are a conservative disposition, conservative partisanship, who are overwhelmingly pro-leave, will of course be reluctant to uh, blame Brexit for adverse consequences, relatively speaking. And at the same time, they will be reluctant to say that, you know, the coronavirus has had a negative impact because they're more inclined to the view that the government has been handling the pandemic well. So the truth is, you know, these two issues in terms of public perceptions have just got intertwined uh, with each other. That said, what isn't true, you know, what you know, one hears a great deal about is the idea that well, in the wake of the pandemic, Brexit's gone off the boil, it's no longer in a division in our society, etc. The truth is we remain at least as divided over Brexit now as we were 12 months ago. Uh, we're st- if, uh, there are not that many polls have been asking, asking it because of the pandemic, but those that do ask you know, people these days whether we should rejoin or stay out of the European Union. We've been close to 50-50 all year. Actually, during the second half of the year, uh, most polls have found those who want to rejoin slightly ahead of those who want to stay out. But, you know, it's 52 to 48. The crucial point is, A, most Remain voters have not changed their minds, despite many claims to the contrary. Most Remain voters have not necessarily accommodated themselves to Brexit. And equally, most Leave voters even if they'd not necessarily think that Brexit delivered what they would hope for yet, but they're still hopeful for the future, uh, most Leave voters have not changed their minds either. That does mean yeah, well, we are still divided as a society on this subject, pretty much 50-50. And frankly, much as the 1975 referendum did not resolve this issue, it continued to be an issue in our politics and in public debate, I suspect that the 2016 referendum is not going to resolve this issue. Either. Let's take a look at something the government put up on its own website on the last day of last year, on New Year's Eve. And we've covered some of this. It said we will be taking back control of our borders, replacing freedom of movement with a points-based immigration system, securing the vaccine rollout, deliver the fastest vaccine rollout anywhere in Europe, and striking new free trade deals with over 70 countries worth over 760 billion pounds. Matt Withers, what do you say about that, that boast at the end about the trade deals? Well, the overwhelming majority of those were taking the previous deals which we had as part of the EU, crossing out the word EU and replacing it with UK. Uh, the, the only initial bespoke deal we've had is with Australia, which is a country with a population about the size of Romania, which is literally on the other side of the world, uh, where it takes a container of about eight to 12 weeks to travel between the two countries. We'll have a negligible effect, I think, an uptick of about 0.09% in, in GDP, uh, an upcoming one. How, have we Zealand, lost it, even less. really? This is what I expected you to say, was actually you can take that 760 billion, but we've lost this, this and this. Um, you're just talking about a small trade deal with Australia. Is there anything significant yeah, well, on the downside? It, well, I think if you were a, a, a small trader who had previously done a lot of business with the EU and now found that the expense and the red tape of doing so has meant that it was no longer economically viable for you to do so. And yeah, and that's that's not, you know, that's not a small amount. David, is that perception that there is more red tape or is that something that you're well aware of and the government perhaps says it's going to change or is ignoring? There is now more red tape to uh, to UK trade with the EU. That was something that was always going to, to happen, even if the, the government had denied it. We're still in the strange situation that the Brexit battle is still in, if you like, being fought. So it's quite tricky for the government to, on the one hand, wish to do something about the the red tape 
um, while on the other hand denying that some of it exists and also trying to uh, resolve a particularly thorny issue around Northern Ireland in that regard. This is what I mean about thinking that we're not yet settled on our uh, on our relationship. Um, it may we may have been uh, divided after the referendum in the in the 1970s, but we were clearly EU members and we went on to to try to make the best of that. It's not yet clear that whether as the government or businesses that everybody has fully come to terms with the fact that we are not in the EU. We are not likely to be in the EU for many years to come. Um, and we have to make the most of what our um, future opportunities might might be. Our future, you know, well, to okay. clean our own future relationship. Let me go back to Matt on this. Matt, if, I'm, if I may, I'm listening to the Today programme very recently, BBC Radio 4. And there was a survey by Make UK that said three quarters of British manufacturing um, believe, but manufacturing businesses believe that uh, they're right to be optimistic that things will get better in 2022. And, and, I, and I hope they are right to be so. Um, just because one supported Remain does not believe that one wishes to see the country perform badly. So, uh, I, you know, I, I hope they are correct. I'm, I'm sure, sure you hope that's that, not what, but what people... why do you believe that they think that? Well, it's certainly the case that the, the arrangements that we have at the moment are not the arrangements that we will always have. This is still an, this is still an ongoing process. So what we might have you know, two, three, five years from now, I suspect those conversations will be will be ongoing. And clearly some of the difficulties that we've had um, in the past year have been masked by the pandemic as well. It, it is true to say that it's, it has been difficult to decouple those two um, those two subjects in 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 what difficulties um, some traders have had as well. So hopefully that will be uh, an uplift as well. Uh, John, let me come to you. I think we've got a few more minutes left. And I want to ask you, in, in all your years, have you ever seen a, anything as divisive as this when it comes to the polls? And secondly, what do you think has surprised you the most? Um, the first thing on the answer to the first one, of course, the one issue that I would regard as equally divisive as Brexit is the question of in Scotland as to whether or not it should remain or, a part of the UK or not. That's another issue now in which this part of the United Kingdom in which I'm sitting is also divided 50-50, and which, like Brexit, taps into people's sense of identity and who they are and what they want their country to be. So it has an emotional resonance uh, uh, that uh, both the, that the constitutional question also has in Scotland. What surprised me the most? Well, I guess it is that actually attitudes towards Brexit really from the moment the referendum was called have been remarkably stable. We started off at around 50-50. We ended up with a slight leave majority. We might have a slight pro-EU majority at the moment. Given that in the 40 years or so of our membership, actually public opinion shifted quite a lot over time, it has been quite remarkable as to how stable people's views have been. And that's certainly been consolidated since because, uh, you know, since the referendum, those labels of Remainer and Lever have become part not only of our discourse, but also of our identity of who we are. And indeed, you know, a society which so far as feeling strongly about politics, you know, not many people these days say I'm a very strong conservative, a very strong Labour supporter, whatever. Uh, a society which all of a sudden has refound its commitment and an intensity to its politics that it's not seen since the 1960s. I don't think any of us would necessarily have anticipated that that would have happened. And that's part of the reason why attitudes have ended up being as stable as they have. Can been. we just um, summarise this in, in less than a minute, both David and, and Matt, with the, the one question I want to put to you. David, do you feel, and the same for you, Matt, immediately afterwards, do you feel more independent than you were 12 months ago as a country? The UK is more independent as a country, but we're far from being um, completely on, on our own. There is so much that we, we depend on working with each other for. We are in a new structure, but it doesn't mean we can just go off and do exactly what we want when we want. And I think that part of uh, the, the whole Brexit process will be to discover the limitations on our newfound independence, just as much as we're, di we're discovering that we have it. It is someone has compare it, compared it to adolescence. I think that is quite accurate.
Matt, we are proud and we are independent and we're better off for it. Um, well, I wouldn't categorize uh, what, what, what was said there as exactly that. I actually find much to agree in, in what was uh, said there. It, it, it may surprise and, and please people. Um, yes, clearly we have left um, a large supranational body, but I think political and economic gravity will see us uh, trend towards Europe in the coming years and decades. OK, I think that's inevitable. And by the way, I was not trying to summarise what, what David said. I was simply putting a statement out there and asking you to respond to that statement. Listen, thank you, John Curtis. Great pleasure to have you on the programme. David Hennick, great to see you. And, and Matt, as you suggested, perhaps we'll be talking about this in three, four, five, six years time, whether you're still uh, with the new European, whether I'm still sitting in this chair. Uh, be it in my home studio rather than the roundtable studio, we will have to wait and see, as with many things. From me, David Foster, from the roundtable team, wherever you are, we thank you very much for watching. We hope to have you company on another occasion. Bye-bye.